All right, after long last, we finally got this video working. Just really quickly, you might notice that the sound's a bit weird, it might look a bit different, but that's because I'm using a different laptop in a different room. So bear with me, it should be basically the same other than that. Um, so the way that this video is gonna go is I'm gonna try to quickly go through all the things that you need to know for chapter 14, which is on mathematics and resources, and there's like a list of things you're gonna learn um, in this video. Um, these slides I'm going to be using are um, created originally by Greg Powers, who wrote um, the HSC textbook that we're using. Um, these are just the teacher resources and I'm kind of appropriating it for this video. So credits to him for creating these initially. Um, anyway, so as I do go through this, I would suggest you pause every now and then to kind of like read through the slides and then listen to my explanations, particularly with the examples as well. When it comes to an example, what I'd suggest you do is you pause the video very quickly, try the example yourself, and then once you've done it, then go ahead and watch my solution, see where you're right. And if, like, if you got it right, awesome. If you didn't get it right, then you can watch my work solution. Anyway, so let's just get into the first thing, which is on water availability. And so basically, as we know, water is a very valuable resource in the world, particularly in Australia with our droughts and stuff. So in this part, we just talked about like there's a few rainfall graphs, so you need to be able to read a bunch of graphs. And then the other thing that we talk about is, I'm not sure if you're aware, but particularly in Australia, like the roofs of houses and stuff are designed so they catch water based on a surface area. So and it, what it does, it gets that water down the gutters and puts it into a tank. So that's how we kind of like recycle and catch water. So we don't always need to be relying on dams all the time. So let's just go through an example. As you'll see, like it's basically just reading graphs and like volume of rectangular prisms and cylinders. So looking at this first example, uh, we have this rainfall graph. And as you see there, the rainfall is measured in millimeters, not milliliters. Um, that's not a typo or anything. Um, the way that rainfall is measured is they got a special device um, which has like a diameter, like it's basically a tube which has a diameter of eight inches and then um, they just measure how far up it goes in that tube over like the course of a month or a year or whatever. So as you see here on this graph, we see that in 2002, it had just above 800 millimeters of rainfall. So it means, uh, you know, it just, in that tube, there was just above eight, uh, 80 centimetres in that tube at the end of the year. You know, they probably added it up throughout the year and got over 800. Anyway, so looking at this graph, very simple. What is the rainfall in 2010? Well, just looking at that, you can just read it off the graph. So 2010, it's about halfway between 1,100 and 1,200. So let's just say 1,150, fairly easy. And question two. Uh, which year had the greatest rainfall? So you're just looking at the highest part, which is 2007. The question is not asking what was the greatest amount of rainfall or anything like that. It's just asking which year, which is 2007. Um, another example is when we're talking about water tanks. So here we have this tank with a diameter of 8 metres and a height of 4 metres. So we want to find the maximum volume. Uh, basically, we're just trying to find the capacity of this tank. Um, so for question one, I should probably do it down here. So question one, well the area, remember the um, volume, we need to calculate the volume here. So volume is area times height, okay? And that area is that base area, so that's a circle. So here we can say area is pi times the radius, which is four meters, so not eight. Remember that's the diameter, we just want like from there to there, so it's 4, so it's pi r squared, so 4 squared, which equals about 50.2654 dot dot dot. Um, so therefore the volume is going to be that same number, and remember we don't want to round to the end of the question, so you know, save that in your calculator or whatever. So we've got that number, we're going to times it by 4, which gives us 201.062 meters cubed to three decimal places because that's what the question asks us to do it in so three decimal places. Alright, so that's part one and then so question two is now just asking, you know, so what is the capacity of the tanks in the nearest litre? 
Well, the conversion that we're going to be using here, and this is on the formula sheet, well, there's two conversions. Um, we know that one centimetre cubed equals one milliliter. Okay, that's one conversion, but that's not going to really help us in that one because we just found the volume in meters cubed, not centimetres cubed. The other one that we can use, and which is what we're going to use, and it's on the formula sheet, is one metre cubed equals 1,000 litres. All right, and that is on your formula sheet. So in part one, you just found the volume in meters cubed. So now just using that conversion, we're just going to get 201.062. We're going to times that by 1,000, and that equals 201,062 litres. So, you know, quite a lot of water this tank can hold. Anyway, that's it for um, containing water, going to the next bit, which is water usage and the way that we measure how much water is being used by the devices in our house, whether that be hoses, whether that be, you know, bathrooms or toilets, washing machines, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, depending on the machine, you might use a little bit more or less. So, a washing machine uses quite a bit of water, whereas if you just left the tap in your kitchen on, you know, whatever. So, you'll be given this information in the HSC questions, it's not like they'll be asking you to think of your own litres per day or anything like that. It gives you all information. These questions are basically just rate questions. So, let's just go to some examples. So, the first example here, again, we just have another graph. And we see that we've got the average daily water usage in kilolitres per quarter. So, obviously, when we talk about per quarter, it means a quarter of a year. Okay, and also we're talking about kilolitres, and kilolitres, that is 1,000 litres. Just like how a kilometre is 1,000 litres, a kilolitre is 1,000 litres. So kilo means 1,000. So, what is the daily average water usage of this bill? So, what we're doing is we have this bill, so just looking at this, um, what this table is looking at is it's got this bill and the last bill and then the same time last year, the average and then the LGA average. I mean, you'd have to look at what those mean, but it doesn't really mean anything in context of this question. But yeah, like I'll tell you in the HSC question again what exactly those mean if you need to use them. So basically we're just looking at the number on this, which is just 0.88. Um, and it's asking for how many kilolitres. So we're seeing that it's 0.88 kilolitres this quarter. So uh, water, ch water is charged is $1.27 per kilolitre. What is the cost of this bill? We just found how many kilolitres um, was used in this quarter. Um, so what we need to do then is find the cost of this bill. Problem is, is that that's the average daily water usage, but we won't find the quarterly payment. So what you cannot do is just do 0.88 and then times it by $1.27. Instead, what we're going to need to do is we have the daily amount of water we're using, so that's just 0.88 again. And what you might be tempted to do is like, oh, well, a quarter of the year, that's about 90 days. No, you can't do that. What you're going to have to do is find the yearly amount of water. So we're going to times that by 365, because that's how many days. And that equals 321.2. So that means we're using 321.2 kilolitres per year. And now that we've got the amount of the amount of water we use in a year, we can now divide that by four. So we'll do three to one point two divided by four, which equals eighty point three. So that's how much kiloliters we use per quarter. And the reason why we needed to do that is this bill is for the quarter, but we we're given the daily amount. So we need to change that daily amount into annual amount. And once we change that annual amount, we can bring it back to quarterly amount. Now we know how much um, kiloliters we use, so now it's just a simple matter of 80.3 times it by the rate which was $1.27, which equals $101.98. And then lastly, what is the percentage increase in the average daily water usage compared to the same time last year? So essentially what it's asking us to do is 
here. Looking back at the graph that we have here, and I know I realize it's getting a bit squished now. This is this one's for this year, whereas this one is for the same amount last year. So if I just zoom into the graph again so you can see it. We see, oh, sorry, the last bill, the same time last year is what we want to be looking at. So we saw that, like, you know, let's pretend that this was for June. Uh, so for the second quarter of the year, sorry. So this one um, was like 0.88 for this quarter, but this time last year was 0 0.75. So what we want to do is first of all see how much of an increase that was, but then also we want to write it as a percentage, okay? So we're going to get that increase divide it by the, you know, the original amount, and then make that as, as that times by 100 to make it as a percentage. So if I just bring it back here. So first of all, we want to find the increase. So increase, that is 0 0.88 minus 0 0.75, which equals 0 0.13. So that means we've increased by 0 0.13 kiloliters per day, but we want to write that as a percentage of last year. So we're now going to do 0 0.13 divided by 0 0.75 times it by 100, which equals approximately 17.3%. Like the three is just repeat forever, but we can just write it as that. And these kind of questions kind of occur a lot, um, finding things in percentages. So that's in this chapter, so that's definitely something you want to be um, pretty comfortable with. So there will be some more examples of that later on. So hopefully, if you couldn't do that one, maybe next time it comes up, you'll be able to do it. So going on to, oh, we also have another example. So here we just have a table showing the amount of liters per day, some different things used. So first of all, how much water is Amelia using each day? Well, basically, like those, we're just going to add these numbers together, right? So question, Number one is 150 liters per day. Like if you if you add up all those numbers, you know, 49 plus 35 plus 34 plus 27 plus 5, it gives you 150. All right, question number two. Um, so how much water would they use in a year? Well, if we just found how much per day, that means we can just times that by 365. So we just do 150 times 365, which equals 54,750 liters per year. All right, and then lastly, so again, like I was just saying, it's a percentage question. So what percentage of her water usage is the washing machine for, like, compared to the whole day, basically? So we're going to get the washing machine amount, which we see in the table is 35, and we're going to divide it by the total amount, which was 150. So it's kind of like if you had a test that was out of 150 and you got 35, what is that as percentage? That kind of thing. We times it by 100, which is about 23%. And it says, you know, an answer to the nearest whole number, which is what we've done. Like I'm just going to get around in there. Anyway, so. A lot of these water usage is basically, here's a bunch of information you use it like with the appropriate rates. Going into the next thing, we're talking about dams, lands, and catchment areas, where we're talking about how we can store large amounts of water. I'm talking about like gigalitres, like, you know, you know, all the dams we've got in Australia. Rather than just having like a tank of water at the back to save a little bit of water for yourself, we're talking about water that's used like state uses. Um, so using like aerial photographs and maps and scales and all that kind of that, we can make estimates of you know the perimeter, um, the length of these dams. Therefore, we can calculate the area because we can assume that it might be like a rectangle or something like that. Or if not, we could also use a bit of Simpson's rule, which you we'll see there as well. And once you have you know the area, you can then times it by the depth or the height of that dam, and then you can find the volume of it. So this is kind of like another application of Simpson's rule, which I'm sure you can see on the screen now. So going into um, these questions now, this question's a bit ugly, like what it is, it's just a screenshot of Google Earth and it's not very helpful. So I'm just gonna, you're gonna have to bear with me for a second. I'm just gonna give you a few numbers to kind of add on to this. So we see here that we're told that this distance here, if you can't really see it, is 800 88 meters, all right? And if you measure it on the page, it turns out to be 6.8 centimeters. 
So what we're seeing here is the ratio, that scale there, is 6.8 centimetres, like just looking at this, is 808 metres in, re metres in real life. All right, so this is where a ruler is really important in the HSC because you might get a question like this, you need to realize like you need to measure how much it is on the graph that you diagram that you're given, and then you'll be given a scale as well. So I realize it is hard to read. And the other thing that we also see is the distance between Canada Bay and Five Dock. So that, I'm not sure if you can see that red line. Um, if we were to measure that, that's about 8.8 centimeters. Okay, so what the question is saying is, um, use a scale, so that's 6.8 centimetres being 188 metres. We want to use that scale to like determine the distance between Canada Bay and Five Dock. So what we're going to need to do is change that scale, like our scale here is 6.8 centimetres and that becomes 888 metres. Alright, that's the scale that we have. Now, it's not very useful for us to have a scale like 6.8 centimetres. We want to know what one centimetre is. Because once we know what one centimetre is, we can therefore find what 8.8 .8 centimetre is. So what we'll do is to change this to be uh, per one centimetre, we'll just divide it by 6.8. Okay, so now we have one centimetre. And then if you do 888 divided by... 6.8 as well, we're also we're going to get 130.588 dot 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 dot. Again, we don't want to round them to the end. So based on that scale that we kind of, that I kind of told you, but you can figure it out if you're given the question in front of you properly. We saw that 6.8 centimeters on this map means 888 meters in real life, which we can then convert that to be per one centimeter. And now that we're on one centimeter. Well, we're just going to get that scale. So we said that the distance on the map was 8.8 .8 centimetres. So therefore, we'll just do 8.8 .8 times 130.588 dot 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 dot, which equals about 1,149 metres to the nearest metre. Okay, so what we've had to do in this question is get our scale, which was a bit ugly to start off, but we then change that scale to be pretty simplified, meaning like we just want it for one centimetre. Once we know what one centimetre is, we can then find what 8.8 .8 centimetres is. Remember, we don't want to round until the end of the question. All right, and then another example, um, and this is also a bit of a weird one. Um, so we have this diagram, it's just worded a bit ugly enough, like, I've been looking at past HSC questions and it's written a bit better, but just bear with me once again. So we see that at A, the length of the left end is about 13. So it's kind of like if I made this to be a bit of a prism, that would be 13. And then we see, so A is 13, the middle length is 12, so this would be 12. And then the last one is 9, so it'll be like a bit shorter here, that's 9. Okay? And then, so, um, if we were to kind of connect these all up, this is kind of like the prism that we have. And then, so what we want to do here is we want to find uh, an approximate volume of this dam um, using Simpson's rule. So, Simpson's rule, as we know previously, was you know, when we talk about area, is you get the first length and then the middle length and you times that by four and then the last length. It's the same thing for volume, except rather than talking about lengths, you're now talking about um, areas. So, like what we're going to do here is we're going to find the area of that. So that's just going to be, I'm going to call that A1. A1. Well, you see that the height is 10 and then the length is 13, so just basically uh, 10 times 13, which equals 130. All right, so we'll say that A1, or AF, or whatever you want to call it, is 130. A2, well, that's going to be that 8 meters times that 12 meters. So 8 times 12, which equals 96. And then lastly, A3. Which is going to be that 11 meters 
and then there's 9 meters. So 11 times 9. And you might be thinking, well, what about those 7 meters? Well, we'll get to that in a second, um, which is 99. So we found these, so that's like meter squared, meter squared, meter squared. All right. Now, um, I might just go back for a second. So uh, again, and this is on the formula sheet, so we're, we're using this, okay? So maybe rather than me using A1, A2, A3, I should have used A, F, A, M, A, L, but it doesn't particularly matter. Basically, this is the first one, that's the middle one, that's the last one. So we're going to get our H, and that's the 7, if we go back to the question in a second, and we're just going to put it into this formula. So let's just go back. And remember, this is an approximation as well, so we'll say, therefore, the volume is approximately equal to 7 over 3, that 7 is coming from these 7 metres in between, like there's like, that's the, what we call the height of these. Um, and then, so it will be 130, so that's, I guess if I would do the label this, this is the first one, this is the middle one, this is the last one. You might remember in the past I've said, the way that you can remember is FML, um, there are more explanations on that bit. And we'll, time, and we'll add 4 times the middle one, which is 96 and then add 99 and then when you put that all into your calculator you get approximately 1430 meters cubed to nearest meter cubed all right which is what the question was asking for that so i mean my diagram isn't very helpful there but that's because the diagram initially wasn't very helpful as well if you do look at some past HSC questions later, you'll see that it's actually a lot easier to read. So, you know, if you have any questions about that, make sure you ask later. But, yeah. So, um, that's all that we need to talk about with water. Now we're going to turn our attention to electricity and energy. Um, so the basic unit, like, you know, the basic unit for water is litres and millilitres and kiloliters and all that kind of stuff. For electricity, it's all based on watts, which we label with W, right? So we have kilowatts, milliwatts, megawatts, gigawatts, all them, okay? So some physicists, people doing physics might know what I'm talking about here. Um, the main one we use in general math is kilowatts. So like, you know, instead of kilometers or kiloliters, we have kilowatts. And then we also use um, kilowatt hours quite a lot. Okay, so a kilowatt an hour is like just the usual rate of power that we use on most things. Um, and it's the amount of kilowatts that are used times the amount of hours that we're using it. So I'll talk about, like, that's, it's kind of like a weird concept, but basically what you just need to realise is the amount of kilowatts used and the amount of hours that is used. Um, so I guess I should, I'll just write that down, it's not already there. Um, so, amount of kilowatts times number of hours. And right, that's what a kilowatt hour is. So we'll use that in an example in a second. So this first example here is we want to determine the running of the following appliances if the average peak rate of electricity is 15 cents per kilowatt hour. So we're told um, you know, this refrigerator with an energy consumption of 840 kilowatt hours per year. Alright, so this is just a simple matter of what's well, that many kilowatt hours and it's that, you know, 15 cents per kilowatt hour. So it's a simple matter of 840 times it by 15 cents of 0.15, which equals $126. So it means, like, throughout this whole year, it costs about $126 for the refrigerator to stay on all year. Okay, so these are all like the hidden costs that are associated to, um, you know, running different appliances and stuff in your house. Um, so question number two, I'll just skip a bit of space. So a 120 watt hairdryer for 20 hours. Now this is different. What you're not going to do is just get that 1,200 and times by 15 cents, all right? Because that's not kilowatt hours. First of all, it's in watts, and it's not in kilowatt hours. So the main thing you want to be able to do is change it from watts into kilowatt hours. 
So the first thing we need to do is we have our 1,200 watts and we need to change that into kilowatts. The main thing we need to do first of all is change it into kilowatts. So we're going to divide that by 1,000, which equals 1.2 kilowatts. Okay? But we're still not just going to get that and then times it by 15 cents because that's kilowatts, but we'll want kilowatt hours. Now remember, kilowatt hours, the way that we find that is, it's the amount of kilowatts we're going to times it by number of hours. That's the main thing. It's not on the formula sheet, but that's what kilowatt hours means. So we're told that we use the hairdryer for 20 hours. So therefore, the kilowatt hours for this is going to be um, 1.2 oh, 1 times 20 which equals 24 kilowatt hours. So maybe what that means is throughout this whole year it cost it like it was about 24 kilowatt hours used. And now that we've got that, now we have the amount of kilowatt hours, so we can therefore do there's 24 kilowatt hours, and again we're just going to times it by 0 0.15, which is 15 cents per kilowatt hour, which equals about three dollars sixty. So what we're saying here is you know, if we only use this hairdryer for 20 hours throughout the whole year, um, that means it costs us about uh, $3.60 in power for all those usages throughout the year, so not really that much. Um, and lastly is sustainability, and you know, as we're building new buildings and houses and everything like that, we want to make it more and more sustainable, and as you see there, there's a thing made by the government called Basics, which is just kind of like an online program that compares um, you know, a particular house or product or whatever with like some specific water and power targets. You don't really need to know what those targets are. In fact, these are very rare in the HSC for it to even come up. But basically, you just, you just calculate like the amount of power usage or water usage something does and see if that meets the target. So if we look at um, these example questions, all right, so this table shows us the type of heating systems and sort of new houses. Um, so what is the total number of new houses? Well, fairly simple, we're just going to add all these numbers up. And if you do add up all those numbers, you get 21,759. And then, so calculate the percentages of new houses in reductive air conditioning. Um, again, this is the percentage question, so hopefully you remember how to do that. So what we're going to do is reductive air conditioning, um, which is... That. So we're going to get 1,622, we're going to divide it by the total, which is 21,759, and which times it by 100, which gives us about 7.5%. Right? So 7.5% of these houses built in this new year um, were built with air conditioning, like ducted air conditioning. Anyway, um, that's just a run through of the most of the things that you need to know with chapter 14. What I'd suggest you do now is, you know, maybe re go through this video again very quickly. If there's anything that you didn't understand, then maybe check out some exercises in the textbook. They're all very sh they're short exercises. Um, but then the main thing I would also definitely suggest is check out some HSC questions uh, for this chapter. It's all on project maths you definitely should be doing that. So if I was to kind of give you a list very quickly of things you should do now, first thing would be to maybe read through the textbook really quickly. So read through the textbook. The next thing I would suggest you do is pass HSC, so project maths questions. I just choose a few. Um, and then I guess the other thing you could do, definitely, is Ed Rollo, right? You have Ed Rollo there, it's a valuable resource, and if you have any more questions, check out Ed Rollo, or feel free to ask me as well. We are going to go through this very quickly on the first day back. I'm not going to spend, you know, two weeks going through this chapter, because it is a fairly small chapter, and hopefully this video kind of serves as, a, you know, a first few steps in this chapter. Um, anyway, hopefully this is useful and I'll see you guys back next week, if not earlier.